Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, it's been a week since the election. Happily, I won't be saying anything about it today. There will be an upcoming podcast or two where I'll get into politics again, I'm sure. You will not be spared. Uh, I have some interesting guests coming up in the next few weeks. However, I've got Stuart Russell, a computer scientist at Berkeley. He'll be on to discuss artificial intelligence. Many people who have publicly worried about the risks of AI, people like Stephen Hawking and Max Tegmark and Elon Musk and Nick Bostrom, are often dismissed by people in the field because they aren't computer scientists themselves. Uh, well, you can't do that with Stuart. He is a computer scientist, and he actually wrote the most influential textbook on AI. So he seems like the perfect person to tell me whether I went overboard in my TED Talk on the topic. So I'm looking forward to that. I'll also have Shadi Hamid on the podcast to talk about his book, Islamic Exceptionalism. He's a senior fellow at Brookings who takes a slightly different line than Majid and I have taken on the topic of Islam and secularism. The psychologist Paul Bloom is coming back to talk about empathy and why it's not as good as you think. And I'm also hoping to have the audio for my public events with Richard Dawkins eventually. So there are some good conversations coming up. Uh, today I'll be speaking with the physicist David Deutsch once again about the foundations of morality. And this podcast came about in a slightly unusual way. Since we did our first podcast, David read my book, The Moral Landscape, and he wanted to talk to me about it. And he wanted to do this privately, I think, because there were some fundamental things he disagreed with and he didn't want to break the news to me on my own podcast. But I urged him to let me record the conversation so that we could release it if we wanted to. Because if he was going to dismantle my cherished thesis, I, I actually wanted you all to hear that. Um, and I also wanted you to hear anything else he had to say, because he's just so interesting. The problem, however, is that I, I ran into some equipment issues at the time and could only record the raw Skype call. So the audio leaves a lot to be desired. And David's audio is actually better than mine, so I, it actually sounds like I'm on his podcast. And because we weren't totally clear that we were doing a podcast, there were parts of the conversation that needed to be cut out, and these cuts leave the resulting exchange slightly free associative. Uh, we put in a few music cues to signal those cuts. Uh, in any case, David is such an interesting person, and many of you, are, I know, are interested in the thesis I put forward in the moral landscape. So I decided the best thing to do is release the recording, warts and all. I certainly hope to have David back on the podcast again, but I doubt we'll cover this territory again or cover it in the same way. So that is why I'm bringing you this conversation now. So one major caveat, however, is that I don't recommend you listen to this podcast without first listening to my first conversation with David, episode 22, entitled Surviving the Cosmos because we really just hit the ground running here. And if you're not familiar with David or his way of thinking about knowledge and creativity, uh, you really might get lost, or at least you won't appreciate how interesting some of his seemingly prosaic comments are. David Deutsch is a physicist at Oxford. He's best known as the founding father of quantum computation and for his work on the multiverse interpretation of quantum mechanics. His main area of focus is now something he has called constructor theory, where he's developing a new way to connect information and knowledge to the language of physics. And as with our last podcast, the irony is we don't discuss any of these things. Though his views about knowledge and the implications of its being independent of any given physical embodiment, the fact that you can have the same information in a molecule of DNA or on a computer disk, or chiseled into a piece of granite. Uh, th this problem of understanding the, the substrate independence of information and knowledge in the context of a physical world, that is occasionally working in the background. And it's one of the things that makes David's take on more ordinary questions so interesting. I mean, for instance, his view about something as pedestrian as why it's wrong to coerce people to do things 
connects directly to his view about what it means for knowledge to accumulate in the physical universe and the error-correcting mechanisms that allow it to accumulate. And if you're not familiar with the way David thinks, many of his statements will probably just blow by you without your realizing that something fairly revolutionary has just been said. So again, please listen to that first podcast if you haven't, and then maybe listen to it again. And you should read his book, The Beginning of Infinity, if you want to get more deeply into his ideas. And now I bring you David Deutsch. Knowledge is basically um, critical. It, uh, so this is actually the connection with what I want to say about your, your book, that, mm. that um, the, the foundational idea of knowledge, that traditionally uh, the, the idea of knowledge has been that we build it up. We build it up, you know, either from nothing like Descartes or from, from the senses or from God or what have you, or from our genes. And thinking consists of building brick upon brick, oh, and from our senses, of course. Mm. Um, and, but um, Popper's view, and which, which of, of science, which, which I want to extend to all thinking and all ideas, is that our knowledge isn't like that. It, it consists of a great slew of not very consistent ideas uh, and, and thinking consists of wandering about in this slew, trying to make consistent the, the ideas that seem to be most worst offenders of being inconsistent with each other by, by modifying them. And we modify them just by conjecture. We, we guess that something might cure the, the various inconsistencies we see. And if it does, then we move to that. Mm. And to get to your book, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what you think of this take on your book. Mm -hmm. um, we're so coming from the same place in some respects and so coming from opposite incompatible places in other respects that it's hard to even express to each other what we mean exactly. And we, mm -hmm. we've just, just, I, I think... The reason, correct me if I'm wrong, or if I'm if I'm if I'm seeing this entirely the wrong way, I think the reason you developed a theory of morality, and and took the trouble to write this book about it, is is not an intellectual reason. It's or at least not primarily intellectual. It's, it's not that you wanted to tweak the best existing theories. And, and improve them, or to contradict some some prevalent erroneous theories, because there are a lot of true and false theories out there, and and usually we don't write about them. We, you know, life is too short. Mm. So I think that the the reason you wrote this particular book and developed this particular theory is, as I said, is not intellectual. It's for a particular purpose in the um, in the world, namely. Uh, to, to defend civilization, you might say, mm -hmm. in a grandiose term. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, to, to defend it against, um, it, it, it's not really too much hyperbole to say it's an existential danger from, or, or two existential dangers. One is moral relativism and the other is religious dogmatism. Yes, that's, that, and, that's very fair and and imputations of grandiosity are, are, are also fair because I, I really, I feel like what I was doing in that book is attempting to draw a line in the sand to defend the claim that the most important questions in human life, I and mean, the, the questions that are, are by definition the most important questions, I and mean, the questions that where the greatest swings in, in value are to be found, that, that answers to those questions exist whether or not we can ever get them in hand, and certainly better and worse answers exist, and that it's possible to be right and wrong, or more right and, yes. and more wrong about those questions. And so, yes, it's it's very much a, I wanted to, to carve out the intellectual space where we could unabashedly defend the intuition that moral truths exist. And that is that, ah, that, yes. that morality is not completely different. Morality and values altogether, you know, claims about right and wrong and good and evil are not 
on some completely different footing from the rest of the truth claims and, and yes. claims to fact that we that we want to make about the universe. Okay, well, um, so I agree that there's an existential danger. So I wasn't using the word grandiose mm -hmm. pejoratively. I, I think there is that danger, and those those whether they're the biggest dangers, I'm not entirely sure, but they are existential dangers, which is bad enough, and. And I agree with with what you just said about morality. Uh, there is true and false in morality, or right and wrong. They are objective. They can be discovered by the usual methods of reason, which um, are essentially the same as those of science, although there are important differences, as I as I said when we last spoke. Okay, so this was your purpose. You had an intellectual purpose that was morally driven. Mm in developing this moral theory. And therefore, you had this moral purpose before you had the details of the moral theory. So you you wanted in advance your theory to have certain properties, um, right. as, as you just said, to create an intellectual space in which one could assert and defend the, the proposition that there's objective right and wrong. And, and so these properties that you wanted the theory to have in advance weren't just expressions of your personality or something. They were the fact that you thought that the moral values that made you want to write the book are true, objectively true. Well, um, forgive me, I'm starting to, I'm smiling now because if you could see me, you'd see how much I'm smiling because I'm just amused at how tenderly you're leading me down uh, by the hand down the slippery slope to the, the dissolution of my theory. I think theory is too big a word for what I thought I was putting forward. I think I'm my theory, such as it is, contains explicitly the the assumption that there's there are many things I can be wrong about right now with the morality that I have in hand. Right. So, like, I, I'm not my theory isn't based on my current moral intuitions it's, well, just, it's based on some of them it's based on the intuition of, of of what i what i call in various places moral realism which is just the claim that it's possible to be wrong it's possible not to know what you're missing it's possible to be cognitively close to to true yes. facts about well-being in this universe about how good life could be if only you could live it or could discover it, if only you had the right sort of mind that would give you access to these states of consciousness. So it's yes. so, that, so that's it's not so much that I think, well, my intuition that gay marriage should be legal is so foundational that I know there's no state of the universe that could disconfirm it. That's not that's not where I'm standing. It's just. It is, no, it's I, the intuition I, about realism and about, about the yeah, horizons. No, I, 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 I wasn't making that sort of allegation. In right. fact, I think I agree with everything you've just said about morality. You see, the thing is, the ideas, the theory, if you want to call, don't want to call it a theory, whatever it is that you express in the book, contains that, but it also contains something else. It contains the something else that I disagree with. <laughs> Let's get it. it there must be something else, otherwise, because I've I've agreed with everything you've just said. Yeah. The thing I, I suppose the basic thing I disagree with, uh, and this disagreement is probably deeper than it sounds. Um, uh, that you, you one of the properties you wanted to create this space is that the that this theory of morality or whatever you call it should be based on a secure foundation. Um, namely, science, or, well, and in particular, especially neuroscience. Well, actually, well, that that, that may be. I mean, I, the, the fault is certainly mine. In from the subtitle onward, and and the subtitle, you know, the way subtitles of books get get fashioned. You, as you probably uh, yes. know, they're, they're, that's sometimes outside the author's control, as it was in this case. But I wouldn't put it that way. I would say that it doesn't. It's not that morality has to be founded uh, on the secure foundations of science. It's that the truth claims we want to make about morality are just as well founded, however well founded that turns out to be, as the truth claims we make in science. And that that really, I'm talking about this larger cognitive 
space in which we make truth claims, and some of it for bureaucratic reasons or methodological reasons, we call these these scientific claims. Some we call historical. Some we call merely factual. Some sciences are not are still struggling to be as scientific as other sciences, but we still call them sciences. But there is just this claim: the claims about subjectivity, and in particular about well-being and what what influences it, and those claims, I think, are true whether or not we can, or true or false, whether or not we can ever get the data in hand at any moment in history. And I just want to say, I mean, the example I, I may have used this last time with you, but the, the example I, I often use is there is a fact of the matter about what John F. Kennedy was thinking the moment before he got shot. And yes. we won't know what he was thinking. We, won't, we don't actually know what it was like to be him. In fact, we know there's no way we could get access to the data at this point. And yet, we there's, there's an infinite number of things we could say about that that we would know were wrong. I mean, I know he wasn't thinking about string theory. I know he wasn't, yes. you know, trying to, I know he wasn't, you know, reiterating the, the largest prime number that we discovered a year after he died. Again and again in his mind, you can you can go on like that till the end of time, knowing what 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 his state of consciousness excluded, and that's that's a fact that's as factual a claim as we ever make in science. And so, I, I, what I was trying to argue is that that morality, you know, rightly considered, is a space of truth claims that is on all fours with all the other kinds of truth claims we make. Differences um, of methodology aside. Y- yeah, well, there are two ways that that something can be objective. Um, it, and, and I think you're in favor of one of them and I'm in favor of the other. That is, um, things can be objective in the sense that um, their truths about them just are truths about the other thing. Like, for example, chemistry, the truths of chemistry just are truths about physics. Um, and that maybe wasn't obvious when chemistry started, mm. but it is obvious now that some of the truths are emergent truths, but still... In principle, every everything, every every law of chemistry, everything you can say about chemical reactions and so on, uh, they are all statements about physics. And chemistry then is is objective because physics is objective. Then there's a different way of being objective: the the way in which um, the integers are exist objectively. They exist objectively not because, uh, and uh, again, in the history of this. Um, there were different theories about the integers that, that took different positions about whether they're real and if they're real, in what sense they're real. Mm. I, I think that they are real in a separate sense from physics, that the truth about them are independent of the truths of physics, not, not that integers are objective because they are some aspects of physical objects, but um, they, uh, they're objective because integers exist in some sense that is not the same as existing physically. And uh, although they, they, you know, they have, they have an influence uh, in uh, truths about them are reflected in truths about physical objects, but they're not identified as them. If, if uh, there's no, nothing we could discover about the laws of physics could possibly change the truth of um, theorems about prime numbers, mm. and that—that that is the kind of truth. Uh, I mean, <laughs> sorry, that's the kind of independence that I think truths of morality have. Um, the, um, you know, you. Uh, the, the, Actually, David, can I interrupt you there and just just yeah, explore yes. this a little bit? Because so I, I think I talk about this in the book at some point. I, I follow the philosopher John Searle here. I don't follow him in, in that many things, but I, I, he made a distinction between the ontological and the epistemological sense in which we can use this word objective. And I think that that's a, a useful one that, that at least I've been pressing to service uh, a fair amount. One, so if something's ontologically objective, it exists, quote, you know, in the real world, whether or not anyone knows about it. It's independent of human minds. It is the kinds of facts you just described with, you know, chemistry and physics. And we can imagine a universe without any conscious creatures. And those facts would still be the case, even though there's no one around to know them. And so that's ontological objectivity. 
And then there's epistemological objectivity, which is to say that there's the spirit in which we make various claims about facts of all kinds, which is to say that so, so to be objective in the epistemological sense, you're not being misled by your own confirmation bias or wishful thinking, or you're making honest claims about, about data and the consequences of logical arguments and all the rest. And what most people worry about with respect to objectivity versus subjectivity, uh, well, I guess I should talk, the, talk about the subjective side of those two things. So something can be ontologically subjective, which is to say it doesn't exist independent of human minds or conscious minds. It is a fact that is only a fact given the existence of minds. So when I'm talking about what JFK experienced the moment he got shot or, or prior to that moment, I'm making a claim about his subjectivity, but I can make that claim in the sense of, of it being epistemologically objective, which is to say it's not it's, it's not subjective epistemologically. I'm not being merely misled by my bias and my my you know dogmatic commitments. I am be I can objectively say about that is epistemologically about JFK's subjectivity that it was not characterized by him meditating on on the truth of string theory at yes. that moment. And so so you can. So I, I'm more worried that the, the ontological difference between objective and subjective doesn't really interest me. It's useful for certain conversations and I think not useful for others. And I think in the case of morality, what we're talking about is how experience arises in this universe and what its character can be. And the, the, the extremes of happiness and suffering that conscious minds are susceptible to and what are the the material and and social and every other kind of requirements to influence those those experiences and so part of that conversation part of that conversation takes us into the the classically objective world of you know in our case talking about neurotransmitters and neurons and and you know economic systems and quote, objective reality at, at every scale that in, in any given instance may not actually require a human mind to be talked about. But the cash value of all of that, if you're talking about morality, from my point of view, is conscious states of conscious creatures and, and whether they're being made more or less happy in, in, as, in as capacious a definition of happiness or well-being as possible. I mean, I, as you know, that's a it's a kind of a, a suitcase word I use to incorporate the range of positive experience beyond which we, the horizon beyond which we can't currently imagine, and the opposite being the worst, you know, the worst possible misery for everyone. So, the status of integers, whether they occupy some kind of platonic zone of existence that is in not, in fact, linked to material reality in any way, but we still have to talk about it as being real, whether or not anyone has discovered it. I, I actually don't, I don't have strong intuitions about that at all. I mean, that, that seems like we, I feel like we touched that in our last conversation. And I think you could probably argue that one way or the other, but to bring it back to what you were just saying, I guess there's the physical reality, which is often called objective ontologically, uh, of chemistry and physics, there are things like integers, which are not, as you just said, dependent on what we know about atoms. But then there are the experiences of conscious systems, whether or not we can ever understand what those experiences are. They have a certain character. And that character depends upon the whatever material requisites exist for those conscious systems. But that hasn't been worked out, and it, and it's also it, it may and it, even if you work that out perfectly, it's still the, it's, it's the subjective side of that coin that yes. is of interest. So so, so yes, <laughs> um, it's funny. Just at, at the end, you 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 said what I was about to say. <laughs> uh, it took me a the, while. So I know that you use the term science, for example, to, to more broadly than some people, and, and, and I think that's quite right. So do I. Uh, and so you and I both use it to encroach on things that 
some people who think they're purists uh, would like to exclude from science. Um, but to expand science, to, you know, so therefore part of philosophy you can call part of science and the, the criteria, Popper's criterion of demarcation is not intended to be either uh, sharp uh, or um, uh, uh, pejorative you know, or criterion of meaning or worthwhileness or anything like that. It's mm. just a matter of convenience, a matter of convenient classification of subject matter. Mm. If you want to extend the term science to cover certain things that are traditionally considered um, a philosophy, like, like the interpretation of quantum theory, for example, which I think is definitely part of science. And, uh, but then if you want to sort of make the connection between human well-being and neuroscience, then you, you, you know you're you're trying to encroach on neurophilosophy, as it were, mm. and neurophilosophy is epistemology. It's and the thing, but once you've extended it to neurophilosophy and into epistemology, you run into a deep fact about the physical world, which is that epistemology is substrate independent. Mm. It is it, it it once you have once knowledge or, or uh, feelings or consciousness or any kind of information or computation is instantiated in a universal device, then the laws it obeys are completely independent of the physics and of the neurology and, and every kind of physical attribute of the device falls away and you can talk about the properties of those things as abstract things, or not at, perhaps abstract is the wrong word because they're perfectly objective. It's just mm. that they're not atoms. Right. <laughs> they're not neurons. I would just say that I think at this point, I'll go with you there. I think, I think that's probably true, but what, you're, what you seem to be smuggling in there in the, in the leap from atoms is a kind of, kind of information based functionalism where we, we just we're assuming for the purposes of this conversation that we know consciousness to be an emergent property of information processing and it's not some other constituent of physical reality that isn't based on bits but if, if, if we if we assume that it is if it's if it is yes. if it is just something that computers non-biological computers can can one day have yeah well that, then I'm with you This is something that, that is generally true of morality, that, that morality has a reach. If you don't steal a book from a library when you, you realize that you easily could do, do so without getting caught, mm. um, this doesn't just affect you and the library. This, this, because this comes from a, a universal machine, which is you. This this um, uh, machine has universal theories, or theories which try to be universal theories, or are universal in some domain or other. Mm. And when you commit the crime, for instance, you're changing the facts. You're changing something that you can't change back. Isn't that change occurring in you, assuming that there's no one else who will ever discover your act? I mean, where else would the change occur but in you? It's well, for example, suppose you're telling your children about morality. Do you say, okay, well, when you're in that library situation, it's okay to seal the book because no one will ever find yeah, out? Right. Or do you say, no, you shouldn't even in that situation? If the, if the first, then it's affecting your child as well. Yeah. And if the second, then you are lying to your child. <laughs> Right, no which doubt. itself yeah. has vast implications. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you there. I just let's linger on this one point that again, it's I understand it's disconcertingly far afield, but I just think it's interesting. So, if you could apply a painless local anesthetic to the child for the purposes of of receiving a vaccine, that would be a better thing to do, and it's being better is the measure of its. Or, or, or the claim that it's better is synonymous with the claim that it's good to reduce needless 
suffering and that the, mm. and, and the suffering is is both needless and, and and in fact probably harmful for the child to whatever degree well, yes i i'd say that my first the first line of my critique would be that it violates the the human rights of the child but but okay there are there are all these other things which are related i think that the way we interpret and value very powerful stimuli is remarkably susceptible to the conceptual frame around which yes. that experience is 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 held and or the, yes. the conceptual conceptual frame within which it is held so which is to say your thoughts about your experience and your thoughts about reality are in many cases constitutive of of the the sum yes. total of the experience and there are many things but this does connect back to I agree with you about about human rights and consent to a large degree. I think I think we want certainly when you're talking about adults who can consent, you want them to be able to consent to various experiences. But I can still imagine experiences that are unpleasant that it turns out are very good for a person, and you have done them a, a great favor if you subject them to these experiences. And you may, in fact, I mean, this is just kind of a, a paternalistic claim, a, a possibility. You may, in fact, be doing someone a favor to subject them to these experiences without their explicit consent, if, in fact, the benefits are so great. Now, I don't, I don't know what those experiences are, but let, let's just say it's true that, you know, a culture finds that there's a certain ordeal that you can put teenagers through, and many of the teenagers don't want to do it, but... It is just so good for you as a human being. That strikes me as possible. I just don't have an example, but I do see, I see people who do consent to do things which are really incredibly difficult. You know, like like people become Navy SEALs. You know, I, I've I've met some of these guys, and you know, they've got they they in many cases literally went through hell to to equip themselves with the with the skills they they've got, and part of the the training is a kind of culling of all the people who are not fit to yes. go through the training in the first place. And so it is a selection procedure, but these guys go through an intense ordeal and come out in many ways enviably strong psychologically and physically as a result. And I can see that there, that there are extreme experiences that we, we might not want to rule out just in principle so, as being yes, bad for us. As I, as I said, that they, if it's a matter of knowledge, if we know this, then um, we have an explanation. If we have an explanation, we can give it to the people. Uh, if if we have a machine that can detect whether somebody would benefit from Navy SEAL training, and it, it can just detect this by putting it on their head and pressing a button, mm. then you would probably find that a, a lot of people who aren't Navy SEALs would benefit from it. And if it's true, if the theory on which this machine is based has a good explanation, mm. then you should be able to persuade those people to but, take the training, or they, they might can't? say, "Yeah, well." But what, what? So what if you can't, or what if the benefits you're conferring on someone ah, is, is, well, it, is out of is, is out of reach to them? So let's say let's say you have people with severe autism who really can't consent to much of anything. And you can't really explain the benefits you're about to give them, but the benefit you're about to give them is a cure for autism. Yes. Well, this reminds me of a you know a cure for lesbianism or something. I mean, there are people who think that raping somebody will do them good under various circumstances. But th th you, you can't base either a legal system or a moral system on saying that if one thinks that that's true, one should do it. Well, no, but, it, but clearly in that case... It cer certainly sounds like it's on its face to be a an, a delusional and unethical claim. Yes, we're considering all sorts of uh, yeah. <laughs> all sorts of implausible things here. What I hear you doing is using the principle of consent and human rights to trump everything else that might. It's more epistemology because I, I don't think human rights are fundamental either. They are they are just a way of implementing. Um, institutions that uh, promote the growth of knowledge. Uh, and the reason why knowledge trumps everything else here is fallibilism. 
in all these cases where we have a theory that something is better, mm. uh, we're, we're implementing a moral theory and we might be mistaken about that. And the, uh, it must be a fundamental fact of morality, of fun, an objective truth of morality, that it's immoral to close off the paths to correction of mm. a theory if it turns out to be false. Oh yeah, I'm to I'm totally with you there. But so so but that seems to be asserting my, you know, underlying claim, which is human flourishing conceived as broadly as you want, and I mean that's a definition that is continually open in in the manner you just described for refinement and and you know fallibilism. That is the point, and you know we want to move in the direction of better and better worlds with better and better yeah. experiences. And who knows how far that can go, but we know it's possible to move in the wrong direction. And we never want to, we, we never want to tie our hands and make it impossible to correct course. Yes. So uh, as if once you have an institution that allows that this is, this is why consent isn't just a, you know, a nice thing to have. It's, it's, it's a fundamental feature of the way we handle ideas. Um, if, you have a system that allows people to enforce an idea on another person who disagrees with the idea, then the the means of correcting errors are are closed off. Uh, you know, you, you imagined people who who had a disability or something and couldn't, but but could be cured of that disability, but it couldn't be explained to them and so on. Well, the thing is, either those people are in a constant state of suffering, in in which case applying the thing to them won't change that. Or there is a thing that they prefer to some other thing, and then there will be a path towards the better state that involves just doing things that they prefer. Mm. Like if it involves an injection, then it might involve um, either an anesthetic or getting into a certain mood in which an in in injection uh, doesn't matter. Let me give you an example. I, I, again, I, I want to get back to these core issues, but all of this is just I find too interesting. I think this is an example that I mentioned somewhere in the moral landscape, but I'm not sure. The Nobel laureate in, in economics, Danny Kahneman, did some research. I think he was just associated with this research. I don't think he was the main author on this paper, but they did some fascinating research on people receiving colonoscopies. And this was in, at a point where there was no like there was no twilight anesthesia associated with colonoscopy, so people really, really right. had to suffer the, the the full ordeal. And they discovered they were, they were trying to figure out what accounted for the subjective measures of of suffering associated with this procedure, and also what would positively influence the compliance of patients to come back and get another one on schedule five years later or 10 years later or whatever it was. So they found that the this confirmed, I don't know if this, uh, this was the first instance, but, the, but there's something in psychology called the peak end rule, which is your, your judgment about the character of an experience is largely determined by the peak intensity of the experience, whether that was good or bad, and what the character of the experience was at the end. Of, of the episode. Uh -huh. so, so those are the two the real levers you can you can pull to, to influence whether someone thought they had a good time or a bad time. And to test this, they they gave, you know, the control group, they gave these ordinary colonoscopies and you know took the appliance out at the first moment that where it was you know, where the procedure was over. But in the experimental condition, they did everything the same except they left the apparatus in quite unnecessarily for some minutes at the end, providing a, a low intensity, a comparatively low intensity, but, but decidedly negative and again, unnecessary stimulus to, mm -hmm. the, to the subjects. And the result was that their impression of how much they had suffered was significantly reduced and their willingness to come back and get a potentially life-saving colonoscopy in the future was increased. So, you know, a greater percentage of them showed up in five years for their next colonoscopy. And so this was a, you know, by, by any real measure, this was a, a good thing 
to have done to these people, except what in fact it was, if you just take the, the window of time around the procedure, it was prolonging an unpleasant experience without any medical necessity, right? And yeah. so that's, so I, I just, just want you to There's got to be a way of, of, of telling them that you're doing this and it's still working. Presumably, but what if, what if in fact it's true that the placebo effect is ruined if you, if you tell someone that, that that might be what's happening to them or that you've done, you've done, you've done this thing, it's not medically necessary, but we're going to leave this tube in for a few minutes because you're going to feel better about it afterwards. What if that actually cancels the effect? Again, um, the universe hasn't got it in for us. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't like us at all. It doesn't care about us, but it hasn't got it in for us. If what you just said is the case, then uh, you could, for example, there'll be a way of getting around it. For example, you could say to them, uh, you could say to the patient, look, there is a, a way of reducing the amount of perceived suffering of this procedure, but it involves a placebo. Uh, but it won't work if we tell you what the placebo is. So, um, you know, uh, do you give us permission to use this placebo? And of course, the patient will say yes. But, but what it, can, and if can that you, doesn't work, the, can there'll really be some consent? other way. But but is that really consent? Because what if we just we'll run the alternate experiment? What if we say we pose it like that to people, and then you know ninety nine percent say sure, you know sign me up. But we we have a another condition where we just now we're just doing research on compliance, and we say we tell them exactly what the placebo is in this case. We're going to leave the tube in you for five minutes mm -hmm. not doing anything. And you're, you're, you're going to, for that for those full five minutes, those will be five minutes where you would have been saying, when's this going to be over already? And you could have been off the table and, and driving home, but you know now you're still on the table with this tube in you. But that's the placebo. Let's say the people who sign up for that drops down to 17%. So now we know that there's all these people in the first condition who are only consenting because you have masked what the placebo is. And so, in fact, they're not really consenting to the thing you're doing. Uh, I think that's still consent, ra rather like you know, if you if you, uh, you you don't have to you don't have to be a doctor and and have know exactly what the heart surgeon is going to do to your heart in order to to um, hmm. uh, consent validly consent to heart surgery. And it's the 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 same with the placebo. You know, if you're told that it, it won't work if you know what the placebo is, mm. but there will be one, then you're consenting. And the the one percent who still say no, uh, those people are just making supposing which true. Those people are simply making a mistake, the same kind of mistake as you would be making if this whole theory wasn't true. You know, we we mm. you can't you can't. Uh, um, bias the rules under which people interact towards a particular theory that they disagree about. But then there are people who have ideas about reality and ideas about how we should all live within it, which are so perverse and incompatible with everything we could reasonably want to do in this world that we, we do have to we have to wall off their aspirations from the rest of what's going on. I mean, yes. whether, whether that's locking them in prison because they just are, are so badly behaved or just exiling them in some way from the conversation. You know, so the, again, but the people I use are like, you know, the Taliban or ISIS, you know, they, yes. they don't they don't get to vote on our public policy. And for good reason, because their votes would be crazy. Um Yes. Well, we again, we, we have institutions. We try to uh, tune the institutions to have the property that um, uh, the political institution should have the property that disputes between people are resolved without violence. Mm. Uh, and the, the moral institutions include the idea that participating and obeying such institutions is morally right. Mm. Uh, and also in, in, in interpersonal relationships that don't involve the law, uh, we still want we, we want a bit better than that. We want we want uh, interpersonal relationships not only to resolve disputes without violence, but we want them to resolve disputes without 
any kind of coercion, an institution that institutionalizes coercion about something is ipso facto irrational. Now, I'm not saying that I know of institutions that achieve this perfectly. I, I'm saying that this is a criterion any more than I do in the political case. I'm saying that that's the criterion by which institutions should be judged by, by how well they are, how good they are at resolving disputes between people without violence, without coercion. Mm -hmm. So, so, but there, uh, yeah. there, there are people, uh, people who are not rational actors who occasionally have to be coerced, right? Yeah. Uh, well, um, sometime in the future, we'll know of ways. We, we already have ways of getting along, which involve far less coercion, like that, as Steven Pinker has pointed out, hmm. than what was needed to stabilize society, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And, and that's, I expect this to continue. And there, there, you know, one day somebody might invent a way of curing the most fanatical mass murderer, um, you know, terrorist mass murderer and and um, uh, converting him to a benign religion or to atheism or, or whatever. Uh, but but, you know, the, initially when this is invented, th this is fabulously expensive because it involves mm -hmm putting him into a into a artificial community with thousands of actors who have to be trained to act in a certain way towards mm. him and, and um, blah 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 mm. and so under those circumstances we still wouldn't do it even though it was possible to save him it's still better to imprison him because uh, the, the in institutions couldn't survive mm. if we had to spend billions of pounds on every terrorist but once it's down to thousands of pounds, we might, we might, um, uh, if we knew how to do it, then we certainly would do it. Well, what, um, what if he, what if he didn't want it done to him? What if he wanted to remain a psychopath terrorist? So uh, I, the way I see that is that, um, you know, he he'd have been caught at some point, and and then he'd have been put on trial, and then he'd be sentenced, and then th these methods would have the property that they would they would uh, you know so a, a good method might have him consent uh, uh, to what was happening after a month and the better one would have him consent after a week and you can imagine millions of years in the future there will be methods so sophisticated you know that they will involve things like doing a brain scan and discovering some memories of his and and uh, working out a customized um, treatment for him, which involves the sun coming out from behind a cloud at the exact moment when he leaves the courthouse, mm. and so on. So uh, I think there's no limit to no limit to the possibility of removing evil by knowledge. Mm. Yeah, well, um, I, I, agree, I agree with you there, and, and and in that case, it's no longer evil; it's just bad luck. You you were the victim of bad luck to be the kind of person who wanted to be a terrorist or or who was you know biologically susceptible to being a yes. terrorist and once we have the the cure for terrorism or the cure for psychopathy or anything else that that falls under the the rubric of evil at the moment there'd be no more moralizing about it than there is moralizing about a cure for diabetes we would just give the well, cure i mean he he would still say uh, after he'd been cured, he would still say, um, what I did was wrong. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I, I think it would be a bit more than to say what I did was a mistake. It's different. Oh, no, he might he might be horrified by what he did. He might say, "That's yeah. I can't believe I was the kind of person who wanted to do that. Yeah, and I'm although so that, that could be cured too. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, but you can imagine a feeling of gratitude to no longer be that person yes. once he was restored to yes. you know, decent humanity by or the yes. cure. That's what, in my view, that completely negates the underlying ethic or the claimed ethic of justice as a matter of retribution. You know, the way oh, yes. we're punishing people because they deserve it on some level. I agree. It's, it's just a matter of operating the institution, which is the best institution we have for achieving this um, absolutely vital purpose. One thought experiment that may expose something of interest or not but and then i then i want to just ask you what you think we actually disagree about because I, I think i might have lost, oh, lost yeah, sight it, of it there's one more, one more important thing i want to say about your book but, mm -hmm. but okay carry, carry on yes well i guess so that 
imagine that this future of, of completed science of the mind where we not only understand the brain basis or the, the computational basis of every possible experience, but we can we can intervene as as completely as we would want. So I, you know, I now have this machine that I can put on your head and you can we can dial in any possible conscious state. It's just this perfect experience machine. Well, wait, but we'll we'll always have limited knowledge and therefore the only states we'll be able to download are the ones with knowledge that we already know. Uh, the vast majority of possible states will always be, un I mean, the infinite majority will always be unknown. Can't we use this device to plumb experiences that have yet to be characterized? Well, there are exponentially many of them. Right. So, so we can't because... Oh, oh, we, we won't know all of them. No, I'm not claiming that there's a, a, a finite number of experiences and we'll know all of them, but there's... There is the experience of knowing tomorrow's scientific discovery which we will never be able to download into somebody yeah. until tomorrow. Right. I would exclude all experiences of that type. I'm, I'm talking about conscious states. I mean, let's, let's just say we've recorded, well, let's trim it down to something simpler, but let's say we've, we've taken a range of people who are good candidates for having the best sorts of human experiences. So we've, we've taken you know, the, the best scientists and the best and the most saintly people in the, the ethical space and the best athletes and the most creative artists. And we've, we not only have recorded their experience and you're, you're able to sample their direct experience, but we've, we've extrapolated from their experience and the, the various commonalities among different classes of experience. And we have produced kind of novel experiences that are in some ways even better or certainly more extreme or, or just fundamentally new to the human mind. So that you you, you take a, a little bit of John von Neumann and you take a little Mozart or, yes. or their, their equivalents that we have access to and you throw in, you know, the, what it's like to be Lionel Messi scoring his, you know, record-breaking goal and you, you, you can get all this tuned up in various ways. And and you've got all the time in the world to explore various states of consciousness to see which you prefer. So my question is, there's something about my thesis that presupposes that we will converge on the, the value of those kinds of experiences, that you, you and I will not have radical disjunctions in our sense of what is good given an ever-expanding menu of possible experience. And if we do have disjunctions, if, if you if you really like experience, you know, 45, and I really like 46, and I detest 45, and, and, and vice versa, well, then that difference will have an explanation about, you know, a neurological one or, or you know, computational one, which will also be open for revision. Then, then, then the question is, you know, how should we change our intuitions about what is good in light of what is possible? And is, um, is it good to change one's sense of, of what is good? There's a kind of a misconception there about, uh, well, at least a, a mismatch between that and how I think of minds. So this assumes that there's such a thing as a happy state of mind uh, that's that's like um, orthogonal to the the question of what is being uh, processed. So mm. you say you know can be be as happy as Mozart. That that kind of omits the question of what specific music, what specific problem uh, are you solving as Mozart? Are you solving one of the ones that he solved when he was alive? One of the specific ones. Well, mm. then in that case, you're just repeating. An experience which is not the same as as I mean that isn't can't be what happiness consists of because we need to make progress. So we're we're I think we're more characterized by our problems than by our uh, particular ideas at a particular time. What are the problems? So a happy person is somebody who has a set of problems which are hard enough to be worthwhile uh, devoting a lot of effort to, interesting enough. Um, uh, and yet uh, not so hard that you can't make any progress. Uh, 
and these problems will consist of conflicts between theories. Um, the conflicts, again, must be interesting and, and so on. Now, uh, it's, it's not obvious that you can download this into something without it simply being a recreation of the individual person. Uh, you know, if, if I get if I get a download of Mozart's theories as they were at a particular time, then it, it's, I don't think it would be, I, I could sort of have the equivalent of remembering what it felt like to solve that problem, but it wouldn't be my problem unless mm. they, uh, unless they managed to integrate it with the rest of me so much that I was actually Mozart, in which case, what's the point? Right. Um, right. One thing I would add here is yeah. that I think there are states of consciousness that are clearly extraordinarily pleasant, and it's the kind of pleasantness that does that does shine through in moments where we are satis we're solving problems in in satisfying ways. But you can tap into this pleasure in a way that isn't at all dependent on having interesting problems to solve or successfully solving them. And it's, in some ways of tapping into this pleasure certainly seem pathological or, or, or at least it's, it's tap, it's, these experiences don't allow you to solve interesting problems and your ability yes. to, to wallow in the pleasure is predicated on your neighbor solving some interesting problems. So if, if you want to be a heroin addict and just lie on the couch all day and dissolve into the bliss of a heroin high, well, you may be able to do that. I mean, let's say there's a, maybe we could probably pick a drug that's, you know, hasn't been discovered yet or invented yet that's better yeah. than heroin, but that doesn't have its obvious downside. But just being able to sustain that, you know, pure opiate pleasure, it may be something which if you could compare it, that experience to the experience of being Mozart, you would actually pr prefer the experience of being on, you know, heroin plus. Uh, but you might. I, I think not. I, you know, you, I think only at first. Yeah, well, that, that's uh, true. So that's that just remains. I mean, that's an empirical question that remains to be seen, and and I, uh, I I share that intuition. But at the very least, let's let's just say that's true. Let's grant the the sort of depressing case that you know the, the kind of the Aldous Huxley style punchline, well, which is we all just want to be medicated into oblivion, and that's what we yeah, would I, in fact prefer if we if we could get our hands on the right I, I think we can't. I, 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 th I think this, this, this is a myth that people um, can be trained to interpret heroin as, so pleasure isn't joy. And people mm -hmm. can be trained by our culture and, and by their circumstances, uh, for instance, if they haven't experienced much joy, to interpret pleasure as joy. But it doesn't fulfill the same function in, in the mind. And, uh, and, and it's particularly insidious because when you first experience it, it might well be joy mm. because then you are investigating a new experience and, and, and a new way of, of being and, and, and you know, new sensations and so on. And that is interesting mm. and therefore can be joy. Uh, but once you're, um, once you're doing this every day and it's your way of life, then it gives you nothing. And if you nevertheless interpret that nothing as being good, then, um, well, that's like being dead. You know, it, it's, 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 it's not a human state of mind. And I think, I think in reality, the vast majority of actual heroin addicts stop of their own accord because they're bored with it. The problem you've just described, though, the, the difference between mere pleasure and joy is obviously a problem that we could overcome with yet more knowledge. So more, more knowledge would allow us to bridge that and you could create this kind of perfect oblivion I, that I, included I, joy. I, I don't think so because what, you know, now you're assuming that there's kind of a joy receiving center in the brain, which receives um, messages from the creating something center. And, and then, but if you could simulate the former center artificially, then that would just, but, but I don't think it can possibly be like that. Um, that, that I, I think the only way you can create joy artificially is by downloading some state of a person who is experiencing joy, and then you would be that person. But, but haven't you ever had um, a, so I mean, this is, again, this is an empirical question, and you might be right, but 
what I'm imagining here is now forget about drugs. Now we're talking about something that's more like the matrix where you could, you know, every yes. mind could be just consigned to this, this oblivion, which could be as creative or as, as apparently creative as, as you like, but it would in fact be this, this isolation where it's, it's just a, it's just a simulacrum where you're huh. not, you're not actually dealing with other minds. You know, you're, you, you, you've lost reality and you're now in virtual reality and, but virtual reality is so good and so creative yes. and so conducive to joy that it's, is there an, in your mind, ethically, is there an important difference between being in reality and being in some kind of dreamscape of our own no, invention? Not, not from the person's point. I mean, assuming that he's gotten into this thing voluntarily. No, it's that what in that case, what he's experiencing is real joy uh, generated genuinely generated by his own mind in the same way that that any other joy is and and actually this matrix like thing is not so far from the truth if we if we're thinking of for example a pure mathematician uh, you know Hardy said that that a uh, nice thing about being a mathematician is that you can sit in the armchair after dinner with your eyes shut and nobody knows whether you're working or not mm -hmm. right. Um, so, you know, he's in the virtual reality of pure mathematics and he's experiencing great joy and great creativity just in the con confines of a few cubic centimeters of brain. So we, we produce the matrix like this and we decide to migrate human consciousness into it. But then then where does consent come into view if, if new minds are simply spawned into this matrix. I mean, how is that any, I mean, you, you and I didn't consent to be born into the universe. There's no one to blame for that. Would we be blaming the generation that, of that, humans who created the matrix for the, for all the rest of us? That, well, they're obviously there, there, there are practical issues, you know, how safe is this thing from real life um, asteroid strikes mm -hmm. and so on. But assuming that that kind of problem can be dealt with, well, then I, I don't see. I mean, it is there is an, an ethics. I use the word ethics slightly. You use you say ethics and morality uh, almost interchangeably. Mm. Ethics, I, I would use more as just a set of practical rules, like the um, medical ethics. You know what doctors have to do to be safe that they won't be criticised morally. Mm. Uh, there would have to be an ethics of um, uh, creating people in the virtual reality, um, if there was a phenomenon of people sometimes wanting to get out, then there would have to be a pass out. Um, and um, that I think that's just a practical problem. It's, there's not no deep morality there. But you, uh, I, you don't have a strong bias. So for instance, at least the matrix I'm imagining, all the people you'd be dealing with wouldn't be real people. I mean, it would be like, it'd be like a dream. So everyone would be in their in a dream of their own that would allow for a kind of maximum creativity, but you're not well, actually so, in relationship with anything so other than. So there wouldn't be, yeah, there wouldn't be genuine uh, collaboration on any problem because the other people wouldn't be creative. Right. So uh, you might notice this after a while, and this might be, but but uh, you know, some people like it that way. Um, that it, it is definitely true that people collaborating can create better and faster than the sum of their, their mm. individual. Uh, but that's only a general rule. It is sometimes people like to work by themselves and like to be by themselves. Um, uh, you know, I'm fairly solitary. And uh, so long as they're free to do otherwise. So I, I think in this, in this matrix where there was only one person, one real person, mm. were zombies. Um, uh, I think very few people would want to be there, but those who did, you know, uh, it's fine. It's, 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 uh, so long as they are creative, that's the fundamental thing. By right. the way, I think there's a, a concept of being entertained by other people or by things or by heroin or by, by, um, TV programs or whatever that is a mistake. We, uh, it, we may subjectively feel or we may interpret what's happening as the other thing entertaining us. But really, the only thing that entertains us is our own creative engagement with it. 
And without that creative engagement, nothing can entertain us. And this, this, you know, when people get this wrong idea about what entertainment is, that that's the kind of mistake where they where they think that that something mechanical such as heroin uh, can can entertain them. There's the, these uh, cliched uh, situations where somebody uh, wins the lottery and then is miserable. And I, I think that the, the generic um, trap that one can fall into in, in this sort of situation is by thinking that money can entertain you, mm. uh, and not realizing that only you can entertain you. And same with uh, you know, rock stars who, who think that if they had a life of uh, as much sex as they like and as much drugs as they like and, and so on, then they'd be happy. And then one in a million of them actually achieves that and they find that they're miserable. Mm. That, that's a cliche which strikes me as very plausible. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I agree with that. I think, however, there, there is another way to be happy. And in some ways, it's, it's a more fundamental way of being happy or experiencing well-being, which is, is in some important sense not the result of being creative. So I, I agree with you that that it that there's this, just to follow your line through entertainment. I mean, the the opposite of, of being entertained is being bored. And yes, but boredom, in my experience, really is nothing more than a lack of attention. And the the, the reason why I say this is so I have this experience of having learned to meditate, and I've spent a lot of time practicing various techniques of meditation. And, you know, from the side of one who wants to be creative and solving problems, much of this, perhaps all of it looks like a quite a crazy and unproductive thing to do. So for instance, I've done meditation retreats where I've gone into silence for in the longest period has been three months on a retreat where you're, you're doing nothing but meditate you know, 12 to 18 hours a day, depending on, on how, you know, how much you're sleeping. And the meditation consists of nothing more than paying very close attention to the contents of consciousness. And, and so for the longest time, when you're learning to do this, the technique is just paying attention to your breath, the sensation of breathing. And once you have some ability to concentrate on, on, the, on breathing, you open it up and you can pay attention to anything that's arising, your moods and, and other sensations and sights and sounds and thoughts themselves arise in consciousness. But for the purposes of, of this practice of meditation, there's nothing worth thinking about. Yeah, I mean, this, this is, it really is, an, the practice is, is kind of, is inimical to creative thought because you have decided not to follow any train of thought the moment you notice it has arisen. And what you what you continually find is that, you know, when you're meditating, you're paying close attention to something, the breath say, and then a thought comes upon you in a way that you didn't notice. And all of a sudden you're, th you're left thinking for five minutes, something, you know, some creative thought or some boring yeah. thought or whatever yeah. it is. And then you, then you notice that you're thinking, you notice the thought itself as an object in consciousness. And then you come back to the practice of just being aware but the, the deeper you go into this, which is to say the more concentrated you become, the less thoughts intrude and, and the earlier you notice them. And, and the moment you notice them, they unravel and disappear and you're left with just the yes. prior condition of consciousness. Totally. And so, but, but this becomes a circumstance of absolutely exquisite happiness and well-being. And in fact, I mean, there's, a, there's much more to say about this, but I would say that at least it's not prototypically creative. You're not, it's not a matter of generating many new concepts or following them to on to new theories or solving problems that require um, discursive thought. So, uh, you know, I, I know nothing about meditation, uh, you know, more than what you just told me. Uh, but so, and, you know, it could be that the whole thing's an illusion, but uh, since it's you, I doubt it. So, most thinking is actually unconscious. Mm -hmm. What we're consciously aware of is just the tip of the iceberg. And even in our conscious thoughts, they're supported by a rich infrastructure of unconscious thoughts. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and those uh, obey exactly the same epistemology as the conscious ones. So they can be creative, they can be uncreative, they can be irrational, they can be rational, they can make progress or not, mm -hmm. and it depends on the same conditions, um, w conditions which either promote or, or inhibit the growth of knowledge in various ways. So assuming that at the end of this process you're a better person, that is your mind is a better mind, uh, that means that that betterness has been created by something. Mm. And if you're not consciously aware of the process, then it's been created by your unconscious mind. And it could be that the that under certain circumstances, um, deliberately preventing your conscious mind from doing anything clears some uh, obstacles to creativity in your unconscious mind. Um, obstacles are, th are themselves ideas and it could be that there, there are um, in fact the unconscious mind almost certainly goes wrong more often than the conscious one so this could be a, a simply a way of enhancing creativity after mm -hmm. all well, well actually I would just say nothing really turns on this but it's definitely true that it is and one of the you know, this is viewed as an obstacle from the side of meditation but it's you know, if you want to be creative, you know, you, you can view it from either side. But when one is trying to meditate and do nothing but that, it's a very common experience to find that you have more and more creative thoughts. Well, you know, if you're a novelist, you'll have the, the best ideas you've ever had for, for dialogue you should write or, or stories mm -hmm. you should write. And, and suppressing all this or letting go of all this in the interest of staying on retreat can become you know very difficult to do, and I've actually had retreats where I have failed to do it. Where I you know I, I'm I'm intending to do nothing but meditate, but I have some idea for something to write or something to think more about that I just convinces me that I you know I, I should not let go of it, and it, it completely derailed the retreat. That is something that happens, but the I would just say that the value of the experience is not merely that it equips you to be more creative in the in the future the value is that there there's a there's a fundamental insight here about the nature of well-being itself and the nature of suffering and, and just the mechanics of human suffering which you can there's a, there's a riddle to be solved here which can be solved which allows you yes it allows you to be more creative in the future allows you to be happier in the future allows you to suffer less in the future which and that all of that is all of that's what's important but in the moment too, it's, it, it also tastes, it is the experience you want to have in that moment. It's, it's, it's like, it, 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 if it's true that it's your unconscious mind being creative, then that's exactly what you'd expect. You'd expect uh, an unconscious well-being to permeate up uh, and then you become aware of it, which previously hadn't been happening because something was, something in your conscious mind was preventing it. The way it seems to me is more that there's you're ceasing to do something that you are helplessly, you're deeply conditioned to do and, and kind of helplessly doing all the time in, in other states of consciousness, which is negatively creative, which is to say it's, it's creative of neurosis and fear and anxiety yes. and, and all the rest. Yes, yes. So you cease to do that. Yeah, creative, yes. Now, well, well I, I feel like you haven't, we haven't totally nailed what we might disagree about because I, I'm just feeling yeah, an, an ocean well, of agreement. Yeah, just as a last thing, let me just say that the, the overview of your book, I mean, I, I think your book achieves its purpose and it, it is a uh, very <laughs> timely and, and important purpose. And if, if I have a criticism of the sort of fundamental logic of it, it I, I can't even say that I'm sure that if if it had been written to conform to what I think, what I'm about to say, it would have achieved its purpose better. Mm. So I don't know whether it would or not. Um, but, but as a matter of truth, so I want to take the same attitude towards moral theories as Popper does towards scientific theories, and therefore regard all the uh, theories about morality which claim to give it a foundation mm. as being mistaken, but all of them uh, have more or less value, uh, some of them much less, <laughs> some of them much more, uh, regarded not as ideas about, uh, about morality, but as critiques. Mm. So 
I, I think that, uh, say, for example, so there, there, are, there are lots of um, different uh, uh, um, suggestions for the foundation, like, you know, Kant's categorical imperative and utilitarianism and, and um, uh, rules is fairness and, and, and the will of God, you know, and, and, and human flourishing. Hmm. So all those uh, are proposals for the foundations of morality. But if you if you regard them instead as critiques, then I think they are uh, they're all quite valuable. Um, uh, and and human flourishing could be interpreted as as a sort of the, as an improvement on what went before, uh, as a critique. So you, you can say, for example, you know, with utilitarianism. Uh, they were able to say, you know, um, if um, uh, what we're supposed to do, uh, what, what, what morality consists of is, is um, going to church every Sunday, what purpose does this serve? And if it doesn't serve any purpose, it's up to the person who advocates it to, um, to make the case. To, to, it, it's a prima facie critique of something that it doesn't have a purpose, and so that therefore it puts the onus on the on the religious morality person to explain why. It, although usually, if something doesn't have a purpose, we can reject it. In this case, we should not reject it. Then he could say, "Well, because God said so," and then there is the standard critique of religious-based anything of how can we tell the difference between that claim. And someone else's claim to uh, based on a different god or a different holy book or whatever. What what criterion should we use? And if he says, well, the criterion is that our our one is correct, then uh, that is a bad explanation because everyone else could use the same criterion. So it doesn't. It's a criterion that isn't a criterion. Mm. Uh, so I, I think human flourishing is is a similar, but utilitarianism. Regarded as a fundamental theory is rubbish. Um, it, it uh, you know, regarded as a critique of other theories, it's very powerful. And I think y your uh, thing is like utilitarianism, but it also has elements of some of the other. Uh, it also has elements of plain common sense, which is often forgotten by these theorists. Mm. Well, let me just recharacterize my foundation a little bit differently because. It's not so much that it's certainly not merely human flourishing it's because it extends to all possible conscious systems. But my base claim is that there is a, a space of possible minds and possible experiences. And there are experiences that are better and worse than others, whether or not we'll ever discover them, whether or not the requisite minds could make judgments about them. But the worst possible misery for everyone is bad, yes. if, if, if the word bad is going to mean anything. And I think that is as foundational a claim as we ever make in science about anything. And the, and the foundation upon which even Popperian science is based, it seems to me, is just a claim about there being a larger reality than the one we currently have in hand, which is to say there's stuff we, we, we can be confused about. There's stuff it's, that's... Uh, it's, it's not a foundation in the sense of being uncriticizable. We can always say, why that criterion and not another criterion? Why assume that we exist? Why assume that there is a truth? I, I think that one is giving up unnecessarily if one says, well, there are some things you just have to accept on faith. You have to start somewhere. I don't think you have to start somewhere. And I, I think all claims to start somewhere are fallacies. Can't you start with consciousness? Because because for me, I mean, consciousness as defined that there's something that it's like to be yeah, what you are in this moment, uh, which is to say, I, I mean, we, you, you don't know if you're, this, this might be a dream, you might be a brain in a vat, you might be confused about everything. But the, yes, fa the fact but, that there's so, there, there's a, the, a starting the, point. The, is... the fact that there's consciousness doesn't get us anywhere. You, you you have a certain substantive conception of what it is to be conscious. And as we've discovered in this conversation, different people can have different conceptions. For example, I I prefer to think of 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 the mind as a dynamic thing that's 
constantly uh, um, not self-consistent. Uh, whereas uh, other people pr- 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 would regard, uh, well, y- you regard happiness sort of more as a state. And I, I think that the, you can't separate it from the specifics of what it is. So that you c- there's no such thing as downloading Mozart's happiness without uh, downloading his actual problems. I agree with that. It's just that there is... I think there, there are two levels to it, but I, I agree with you that and this comes back to the framing issue, just that the fact that certain experiences of suffering or unpleasant experience can be framed in such a way that they seem to be great, you know, peak experiences of, of, of well-being. But I, but I, but all of, all of that is, again, these are just empirical claims that could be borne out more or less. So for instance, if, if someone could, you know, you're going to have your next year of creative thought now, and it will be whatever it will be. You know, you're a, a mountaineer of physics experiencing pleasure and pain, but even the pain is is adding to the interest, say, to, to some degree. Yes. But but some pains aren't. Let's say, let's say we could add yes. some, we could add something to your tea every morning, which would make you just a little bit happier in the conventional sense throughout all of that creativity and theorizing and and let's just say there's an optimal way to dial it so that it's just a fact about you that it could be it could be twice as pleasant as you're tending to have it and you'll be just as creative right so i I think yes i I think we should do that but i I don't think it would add I, i don't think the um flourishing meter would would register this, even, even though we should do it, which I suppose is an argument against your theory. <laughs> but, but, why, I, no, I, but why, why would you say that? Because if you lost this thing, but let's well, let's let's go yes. let's go better than double. Let's say by a factor of of five or ten, so that that the kinds of days you would have going forward, if you reviewed your history of being a conscious being, you would recognize that that the, the days that you, you're going to have three hundred days this year that previously, each one of which would have been the best day of your life previously, and you're still going to be as creative. Nothing will be lost in terms of, you know, you getting things done. You're saying that the flourishing meter wouldn't register that? Yes. I mean, it, 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 I've slightly lost track of exactly what you're putting in my tea here. <laughs> but it's good tea. If, it, if it's the... Either it's going to be a mindless thing, in which case, uh, as I say, it is worth doing. So we are we are accustomed to levels of physical comfort that would have been inconceivable even, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years. People like, say, Newton or Mozart um, lived lives of, of incredible awkwardness and uncomfortableness and you know that it was never never really warm in the winter and it was never really cool in the summer Mm. and the 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 bath was never the right temperature and the the food never tasted quite right and and they were constantly in danger of various kinds and their clothes itched and you know i could go on forever and ever and and yet they were happy it was possible to be happy under those circumstances Mm. It's definitely worth the change, and if only for the fact that, that the change itself is a creative and 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 uh, beneficial thing. But once you've done the change, once you've had it once and for all, I don't think you're any happier for having had that comfort. The, I think the only thing that actually makes you happy is actually creating. But but it's understandable coming from you, but it seems like a narrow definition of happiness that 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 a a scientist and an an artist could easily sign on to. But many people who can can still register differences in their happiness, changes in, in, in their well-being would would not really recognize. So, for instance, what has happened when you're going along, you're very happy you're as fulfilled as you've ever been, but then, you know, your wife dies or your child dies, and now mm-hmm. you're not not as happy for obvious reasons, but those reasons aren't best summarized by a sudden lack of creativity on your part. I, I, I think they are. I, I, I think that the reason why you're unhappy is that you're the, the 
um, your your previous methods of making progress in thinking were tied to these people who have died. And uh, you can't just instantly replace what you would have got from them by something else. But then what, and do, you I by, think what do you mean by progress? Because this is, and I just said progress, I, I caught your accent. Um, <laughs> right. what, what, what do you mean by progress? Well, uh, I, remember, I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not snobbish about what kinds of knowledge count as knowledge. All, all kinds of not all any kind of state of mind which one regards as preferable to another state of mind can't be reached without creativity. And reaching it is kind of what happiness is. So somebody who who uh, doesn't isn't interested in science and isn't interested in in art or any th- of the things usually regarded as progress or creativity might still be thinking about something. All it takes is for them to be a better person in regard to X after Mm -hmm. the thought than before. And X might be, might be anything, might be something that's impossible to name. It doesn't have a name because it's not socially valued, but it, it might be um, you know, a particular way of interacting with the family. Mm, right. um, but th- they would have to be improving it. They would have to be, uh, you know, if they think back, they, they uh, would think, yes, uh, I, um, I, I, could have done, I could have done it better, and now I am doing it better. Mm. And even if that's, you know, enacting Jewish rituals, uh, at, 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 it, anything like that, you can get, Anything that you can get into and improve at by your own standard takes creativity. And that, that's what it takes. And uh, lots of people don't do even that. And I think they're in a, in a bad way, even if they are saying that they're not. Right, right. So, so then to come back to the, the fundamental disagreement, which ha- has something to do with my reliance on fundamentals or my, my, hand, yes. my hand waving in the direction of... of a foundation here. I, I may have seemed to be doing that more than than I was, or that, or I mean, some of that may be dispensable for me. But so, so come to the my argument about the worst possible misery for everyone being bad. What is wrong? Yes. What's wrong with that claim? So I mean, just imagine a, uh, univer- a, a universe in which yes. ev- anything that can suffer, any conscious system that can exist and can suffer suffers as much as it possibly can for as long as it yes. can and nothing good comes of it they're not they, this, there's no silver lining to the suffering this is just the worst possible hell that exists my sense is that everything so that's one possible state of the universe and but, ev- but everything I'm else is better denying, than that everything everything else yeah, is better I, than that yes I, I i'm not denying that there's a um that there are objectively better and worse states, and and that's one of the ones that's objectively worse. But, Whether but, but that's my we found, would agree about the details of which. Well, the thing is, different different theories of morality and different theories of of human flourishing will disagree about exactly which is the worst possible state. Oh, this, um, you know. Well, no, no, because I I think okay. Well, let's just so then so then the image for me of. The moral landscape again is, you can't download this worst possible state into me just by itself without looking at the details of what is actually happening any more than you can uh, download mozart's happiness oh yeah so I, I'll, I'll grant you that so but let's let's just say that so we have a, a universe of a a finite number of beings we'll talk about the worst possible misery for everyone at time t which is you know which is obviously defined by who everyone is consists of so there's all there, whatever beings are, are here are here and each is as miserable as he or she or it can possibly be given the sort of being it is and given its entanglement with all other beings so let's we just we just make this as bad as it can be there may be some vagaries here where you know if you make something really really bad for one being, things get a little bit better for another being, given how they're entangled with each other. No, so, no, never mind that. Never mind um, that. Yeah. Let's just make it, you know, you know, if there's not one worst possible, there are a finite number of worst possible states for all these beings to be in. 
Yeah. And if we change that, if we if we start making life better for them, you know, all together or or even just some of them, that's moving in a direction that we will call good. And there is no other way to there, there so what I'm what I'm claiming here is that any theory you have about goodness has to entail moving away from that worst possible misery for everyone. It, it, if it's going to be Kant's categorical imperative, if it's, if it's going to be deontology, if it's going to be religion, if it's going to be consequentialism, if it's going to be virtue ethics, if it's going to be something that has yet to be invented. It has to recognize that movement, that navigation in this space of possible experiences away from the worst possible misery for everyone is what is in fact the cash value of goodness. Yeah, though. So- Though once you're more than a millimeter away from this worst possible state, um, there are lots of ways of getting better, and some of them are better than others. Mm. And uh, a, a lot of, you know, once you get as far away from that as we are, uh, many things affect what people think is, is right and wrong, good or well, what, what people think is flourishing. And the, the worst possible state if it could exist, I'm not sure that it can, but if it could exist, if it's if it's unique or if there's some equally bad ones, uh, which everyone would, would agree were equally bad and the worst, they have the property that you can move away from it cre- um, without creativity because you can simply download any other state into mm-hmm. those people's brains. Um, but once you get a certain distance away, and, and that sort of amount of getting better isn't worth very much. It's, it's um, you know, it's, it's saying, okay, you're cured, you, you know, um, you're cured of cancer. Now you are happy and, and the person isn't because they were, weren't happy before. Mm. And now they're back in the state um, that they were in. And, or, you know, you let someone out of prison and they go back to their old life. Uh, and the 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 fact that it's all better than the worst possible one doesn't actually resolve disagreements about what is worse or better well, now. So, yeah. So that, but then that's why my my metaphor of the the moral landscape seems relevant to me here because I, I acknowledge that there are there are peaks and valleys here which which we may disagree about and and we and we it may in fact both be right. So for instance, there could be an equivalent peak some distance from where we are, where human, where beings just like ourselves could live very different lives that would strike us as, as morally perverse. And, well, you know, there's it, an even, then, yeah, in that case, there's an even better peak, which is better than either. Exactly, exactly. So, and, and we'll, we'll never discover it because we are just are unlucky or we just don't have the right minds to discover it. We, you'd have to change our minds, change our brains, you know, uh, augment, augment I, I, them. T- since we're general purpose, I don't think that's possible. Um, well, you'd, I, I, well, you'd have to augment. You'd have to. You'd have to give us more memory and more processing yes. speed and all the rest. Yeah, we already do that routinely. Right. So, but but in the, any case, it's just a, it's just a contingent fact of the history of the cosmos that Homo sapiens will not explore this one peak that could be explored. With the, with the right technology, and it's it is better. It's better in every in every rational way we could talk about better and worse than yes, what we've we'll, got. Yes, we'll just find an even better one and bypass that one. Right, but, but yeah, and so that, this could continually recede. So, like some peaks are, we'll, yes, we'll never arrive at the peak, right? Yes, or what will seem yes. to be a peak will recede based on you know more computational power given to us. Yes. Well, I actually, uh, I, I, I think that the, the real fact is that whenever we make a great discovery, it, it creates more problems. Mm. So the same is true of morality. Uh, we, 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 we get better and then we find that that getting better itself creates more problems. Right. But, like, they're, but they're not problem. They're, they're more refined problems. You're, you're trying to figure out whether you should be a vegetarian, not whether you can rape all of your well, captives. Well, there's also, um, you know, we've we've abolished war and therefore we find self-defense more difficult. Right, right. But that, but that, those are kind of local wrinkles based on just how many of us are still barbarians or how bad our institutions are at, at well, that, cr- that's, creating order to our world. I mean, we, we are still the, apes. Yeah, all problems are parochial, but I, right. I think the the fact that 
that improvements create new problems is a universal fact and mm. it'll it'll always be true so we we a peak will only look like a peak when we're approaching it when we're at it we'll see lots of problems there right but i but I, you can imagine how ethereal and high class these problems could become right i mean imagine from our perspective yeah yeah but even from the perspective of i mean because certainly certainly you've been in some state of high creativity and high pleasure and very low, you know, physical complication where if that could just endure for the longest time, the kinds of problems you would be noticing are the fun problems of which is more beautiful, A or B, as opposed to, you know, I can't get the cockroaches out of my kitchen and I'm just yeah. driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I think I'm agnostic on that one. I, 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 how, what, for example, will there always be existential problems? I don't know. Um, I don't know why there should be a limit on the size of mistake we can make. Well, that's, yeah, um, that, 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 that is a problem. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there, there always is, there always is a way we can improve, but we may not take that way. But by your own description, we tend to successfully automate the solutions to these problems in a way that doesn't require any more work. So that, like, you, yeah. you don't have to you don't have to reinvent clothing. You just buy a new yeah. jacket when you need one, and and the problem is solved. Yeah, but uh, you know, in 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 a few billion years time. Uh, we'll have an existential problem that we have to get out of the solar system or because the sun is going to become a, a red giant. Right. And uh, who knows what kinds of moral problems will be raised by it. Presumably not the problem of who gets to leave, because by that time we'll have very powerful machinery. But, you know, I don't know. Maybe by that time there there are whole classes of severity that will not be known anymore. Um but as I said, I, I don't see why that should be. I, th 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 how can there be a limit on the size of mistake we can make? Um, th that, that would seem to be an engine for producing truth, which can't exist uh, without creativity. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, well, it, so may that, that be our biggest problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah how, <laughs> to, about that now. how to escape a red giant in time. Yeah. It'll take me re-listening to this to, to see where and to what degree I've lost the thread of our disagreement, but I, I'm not sure. I think my summary of our disagreement, insofar as I understand it, is that you are allergic to the concept of there being a foundation to knowledge, moral, moral or otherwise, and you follow Popper in this line. And I basically, I think I agree with you insofar as what you tend to mean by foundation except I, I, I view this claim about reality exceeding our knowledge, which is to say reality exists whether we know about it or not. And this, this in, includes possible experiences. I feel like that's the only foundation I need to get the ball rolling in. And, and then I'm, I'm happy to have it roll in a Popperian sense of, of it being open-ended, kind of endlessly open-ended and requiring continuous correction to our theories and, and the, the way I've thought about it without really thinking about Popper, but I do think about morality as just a navigation problem and, and just forget about the concept of moral truth or truth at all. We are conscious systems that are moving in a space of possible experience and we will continually discover that some are better and some are worse, some are more creative, some are less so. And we're not wrong to be wanting to move away from the worst possible misery for everyone yeah, and but, up some but, peak. We'll be changing our opinion of what constitutes better and worse, and we'll be doing that by the methods of reason. Right. Uh, not, I think, predominantly. I think this, this is maybe an even more fundamental disagreement between us. I think not predominantly by the methods of science. There's, uh, I, so I'm, I'm just looking at your book and that... Uh, you, you quote somebody or other as saying there couldn't be a science of the human condition, mm -hmm. and you're very scathing about that. You 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 describe that as 
faith in the intrinsic limits of reason. Right. But I, I think it, I mean, again, you use the word science in a slightly different way, uh, but I have, I have um, faith, if you like, in the non-existence of limits on reason. Right. But and and the reason that there are limits on science is is a is a very prosaic reason. It's 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 not that there's an impenetrable barrier. It's it's just that prosaically you can't use theories to address issues that the theories aren't about. But you you can form theories about the things that it is about. And you know moral things. Mm-hmm. You can improve those by the methods of reason. And science is occasionally relevant. But I, I don't think it's fundamentally relevant, or especially neuroscience, because yes. neuroscience has its effect via a universal machine, which, which blanks out all relevance of its details. The, the fundamental thing there is that, yes, that, that is my being scathing about that point, about there couldn't be a science of human nature, is really, it, it is synonymous with with the faith in reason that I share with you. And the fudge there is that I, I do have this more elastic definition of yeah, science. Yeah, and, and yeah. Because I, I just view things that don't, I mean, I, because the, again, the boundary bet, between science and the rest of reason is not clear and, and we will we'll continue yes. to, to surmount it in, in surprising ways. So it's suddenly something that didn't at all seem open to science a moment ago is all of a sudden something that we, you know, people in white coats are testing the veracity of. So, I mean, one example is, I think I use this in the book or uh, somewhere, where the the question of, you know, is is the Shroud of Turin really a a relic of of the historical Jesus or not? Well, that's that's that's, that's, that's a religious claim. It's a claim about history. It doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem a claim about science at all, but then all of a sudden you, someone invents the, the yes. method of radiocarbon dating, and now it's a claim about chemistry or physics, depending on who's doing yes. the experiment. And I, I just noticed that that's, that's continually happening and going to happen and going to happen even more. And and the direction and it's and it's unidirectional, right? It's it, it only goes toward science and never away. Science keeps capturing this ground and no longer and, and doesn't lose it, right? So the the moment you have radiocarbon dating. And you're going to ask whether a piece of cloth came from a certain period in history. Well, it's a scientific question today, and it's a scientific question tomorrow. I don't expect science at any point is going to say, actually, that, we're no longer in the radiocarbon dating business. Well, once we're all in the matrix, for example, if we decide to all migrate into a matrix and, and stay there, then all questions about what we should do next will will not be scientific questions well that, uh, that, apart from extending the machine or something right well let's plant a flag there that is a fascinating topic for a future conversation obviously the, the question about where this is all headed technologically is is not going away and it's only going to become more and more interesting so some podcasts hence i i, I think you and yeah. i can talk about that but i i don't know that there's no question at all that I could have written that book better than I did because it, it's actually it's actually the battlerized version of my dissertation and and the reason why the neuroscience is in there is because it was a it was a you know there were two, ah, there were two right. two fMRI experiments at the center of that dissertation which you know were connected to my thesis but I totally take your point there which is that the neuroscience is 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 not central in principle or in practice to many of these questions, you know, but in terms of understanding what well-being is at the level of human beings and, and their lives, questions about what is happening in the brain are potentially always relevant. And, you know, the, we can ignore them when when it's easier to talk about thoughts than it is to talk about neurotransmitters. Well, then that's fine. But then there, the conversation always can come back to the details of neuroscience, you know, when relevant. Relevant when we're not talking about something on the universal level, uh, um, like, for example, um, how exactly emotions are related to sensations. Um, that's partly a matter of hardware. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and how uh, sensations are interpreted, um, especially visual ones. That's also partly a matter of hardware. 
And there are also surprising connections. I mean, so there are things that we can discover about the brain based on the rather crude techniques of neuroimaging as they currently exist, which can lead us to understand connections that we may have never noticed on the on the subjective side. I think one example I use in the book is, it's not the best example because you, you could have noticed this subjectively, although not that many people have, I think, but there was an experiment done on on envy and schadenfreude. So it, it was just, it's found that it's, people tend to feel schadenfreude for people whom they envy, right? So there's a connection, like the, there was a, and I could be getting the details slightly wrong because it's been now years since I, I looked at that paper, but there was a neuroimaging experiment that showed a connection between feeling schadenfreude for people. You know, when you see someone trip on ice and you feel, you know, this surge of happiness, you, you will tend to feel that more for people who you envy. So when you see the rich woman, you know, be, you know, bejeweled with her, you know, Christmas shopping bags in both hands, slip on ice, you will feel a, a surge of schadenfreude, which you might not have felt for a homeless person sl slipping on ice. And envy is somehow, so that there's a relationship between schadenfreude and envy. Let's just, let's just assume that's a fact about us psychologically, subjectively, the common neurological real estate that, that can be found in an experiment could help us to discover that about ourselves. And there may in fact be things that you would never notice subjectively, but which are there to be noticed, which discoveries about the hardware point you to. And, and actually one example, I think historically, if I'm not mistaken, is the optic blind spot. I think that the fact that we, we understood the anatomy of the, the retina and that it would dictate a blind spot is what caused people to first notice the blind spot subjectively by closing uh -huh. by, by closing one eye and you know putting a dot on a piece yeah, of paper yeah. and moving it. But once you realize that the, the optic nerve is transiting through the retina and there's going to be part of the retina that's not registering any information, that, that then people went in search of the, the blind spot and found it. I believe that's true, but in any case, it's, it, you know whether or not it was historically true. It's, it's certainly it could have been true. Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing could be true easily. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, neuroscience for me is is relevant in in all of those ways, but it, for any for the purposes of any conversation, you know, certainly need not be brought in and may in fact just be complicating things unnecessarily for for the purposes of that conversation. I, I want to also yes. give you an award for the best possible blurb that is non-committal and not obviously denigrating, which is the book achieved its purpose. Full stop. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that hilarious. Is, that is a big accolade. <laughs> no, well, no, no, but it could, it could, it might, might also be given to Mein Kampf for some other book. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. The book <laughs> achieved its highly worthwhile and necessary okay. purpose. Right. <laughs> I like the book achieved as far as that reminds me. I, I, I know someone who, who works in Hollywood who's constantly in the experience of going to movie screenings and coming out of them just hoping not to run into the filmmaker because he hated the film and and you know this this person is a friend or a colleague and he doesn't know what to say and how how to marshal his euphemism so as not to be totally dishonest but also not totally insulting. And I was with him at one of these screenings and I knew he absolutely hated this movie. And we run right into the filmmaker as we're walking out. And he, lo he looked earnestly into the eyes of the filmmaker and said, you must be very proud. <laughs> <And> that, <laughs> okay, that's nothing like what I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, David, it's once again, it's a thrill to talk to you. And I don't know if we made progress that anyone can measure, but I, I certainly feel like I am a better person every time we talk. So thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. You can leave reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. You can share it on social media with your friends. You can discuss it on your own blog or podcast.